Greetings, seekers of the senseless and insane. Welcome once more to my music hall of menace, my malice of varieties, my vaudeville. <laughs> <coughs> but first, I have reluctantly agreed to allow my abnormal assistants, Anthrax and Snuff, <laughs> to entertain you with another in their incessant series of sinister speciality acts. It won't last long. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present <laughs> Juggling with Germ Warfare. <laughs> uh, yep! <laughs> oh, oops, yeah. oh, thank you. We'll be fine as long as no one breathes for a bit. And exactly how long is a bit? Oh, about 20 years or so. I just call it 50 to be on the safe side. Anthrax, snuff. Breathe it in. All of it? Every year. But we'll... Breathe! <laughs> and now, hold those breaths whilst I prise open the poisoned portals of my little palace of punishment and unleash upon my audience another morbid morality play from the cabaret of Dr. Caligari. A noxious nightmare of relentless neglect. A stenchful story of a selfish society and the sicker excesses of its so-called men of science. A tale I entitle, The Homeless Who Ate London. <laughs> You are now entering a restricted area. Please refrain from smoking or making any sudden violent movements. This is a long corridor, my friend. The longest, General. In the secret underground installation business, you judge a man by the length of his corridor. I like the echo. It's tight. And it makes the corridor so much more dramatic, don't you think? Ah, oh, here we are. Welcome to SlaughterTech UK's Weapons Research Establishment. Before proceeding, will you please place your right hand against the sensor for fingerprint screening? Thank you. Identification positive. Before proceeding, will you please insert your credit card into the cash machine for financial screening? I'm sorry. We take all the major banks. South American Express. That will do nicely. Thank you. Credit rating positive. He can afford it. Then, let's do business. Have a nice sleigh. Spare some change, please. Spare some change. Go on, just ten pence. Can you spare ten pence, please? Can you spare ten pence? Just ten pence more and I'll have paid me mortgage. There you go. Cheers, pal. Oh, look, Lois, isn't he Dickensian? No photographs, please, folks. I'm under exclusive contract to the world in action. But if you'd like to make a donation... Bloody tourists. I'm not a tourist. I live here. Here! Nowhere. Ten pence, mate. Spare some change. I haven't got any money. And yet you're still alive. Amazing. Oh, I've only got a couple of quid, but I need that. New to London, are you? How can you tell? Oh, uh, the rucksack, the expensive trainers, the... Please steal all my property and exploit me, look. That obvious, eh? Worse. How old are you? I'm old enough. Underage, eh? I bet you had them swarming around you at King's Cross. I wasn't born yesterday. No, but you look like you were. You're not going to last five minutes. Why not? Sorry, the free advice session's over. That's your lot. But that's not fair. I just but want... For the price of a special brew, I might be persuaded to give you a few survival tips. How do I know you're on the level? You don't. I'll teach you how to work that out in lesson two. So I was about it, pal. It's 
afternoon, Professor Sudinin. The agent, Orion. I wonder if you would be so good as to show the general here some of our current projects. My pleasure. Here we are developing the next generation of computer-guided missiles. Missiles that can be programmed for an astounding degree of accuracy. We have heard much of your so-called smart bombs. Smart and getting smarter. <laughs> new weapons for a new age, General. We are entering an era of cleaner, more clinical, more caring warfare. Uh, this bullet here shoots you dead and then helps your family to cope with their loss. <laughs> I suppose even your camouflage exports have gone green. Very good, General. <laughs> now, if you'd like to step this way, we'll show you the nerve gas. So I said to him, Dad, I'm coming out. And, and then he said, no, son, you're going out. I know you went. I came down south because Norman Tebbett told us to. Get on your bike and look for work, he said. So I did. Trouble was, while I was looking, someone stole the bike. And I've been stuck here ever since. Here, have a drink. Uh, no, thanks. It's all right. The hepatitis is clearing up. You won't catch anything. That's better. Get it down, you son. And then I'll take you to the bull ring. Hold on. That's in Birmingham, isn't it? It's also the roundabout outside Waterloo Station. Lots of people sleep there. Now, are you going to drink from that tin or just hold on to it till the beer boils? Sorry. Tell me, Professor, what do you call that strange pulsating mess in the tank over there? Um, we call that... Green. Could you be more specific? Green and uh, lumpy. What an extraordinary sight. Tell me, how did you make it? Quite by accident, actually. A consignment of radioactive bacteria ran right into the canteen dessert trolley, and when the smoke cleared, that was sitting where the jelly and custard used to be. Fascinating. Yes, and also highly toxic. Head. It seems almost alive. If you're interested, I could let you have it at a very generous discount. Would it aid me in subjugating the peasantry and liquidating the intellectual bourgeoisie? Uh, not unless you thought throwing handfuls of it at them might help. I think not. A pity. You could have saved us the cost of carting the stuff away and dumping it in an area of outstanding natural beauty. A shame to hoist something so. Unusual. Yes, I find it quite compelling. I'm sure if the professor had his way, he'd take it home as a pet. <laughs> How whimsical. Now, would it be possible to view the big armored vehicles that crash students? Uh, certainly, General. This way. Thanks for stopping. My pleasure, love. It's good to have a bit of company on the long hauls. They're the loneliest. What exactly is it that you're hauling? Oh, that's an official secret, love. What kind of official secret? Gunk. All right, then don't tell me. No, straight up. I've got a tanker full of green chemical gunk back there on its way to be dumped down a hole behind some yokel village in Yorkshire. You're not very environmentally friendly. Oh, it depends on the environment, love. So, uh... Where is it you're planning to stay in London, now? Oh, I've got a friend, and uh, her cousin's a photocopier toner changer for just pubescent magazine. My friends reckon she'll probably put me up for a night, help me find a job, and get me into lots of raves and stuff for nothing. Good, eh? Dad will have a fit when he finds out. And if she won't help you? Then I'll stay in a youth hostel, till I get a job and, and, and a flat. Are you trying to be funny? No, but you can't be too healthy sleeping in a subway in the middle of a traffic roundabout like this. I mean, all the fumes, all the noise... You go see how healthy it is, sleeping alone in a freezing doorway, waiting for the queer bashers to come along when the pubs chuck out. Here, we've got heat, we've got a bit of security, and the police can't pick us off quite so easily. I love this roundabout. I love the way those fat, comfortable commuters have to go out of their way to get round us. You've been sleeping here long? Longer than most, but not much longer. They're closing it down soon for repairs, they say. 
They reckon that the heat from all our fires has damaged the road support. <laughs> One day the whole thing could collapse and we'd have the whole bloody rush hour down here around our heads. <laughs> I'd love to see that. All those commuters suddenly plunged down here with us. They'd think they'd died and gone to middle class hell. <laughs> yeah, pass us a bit of wood for the fire. Been asleep long. Ages, love. Sleeping like a baby. Oh, we're in London yet. We've been in it for the last hour. Central London's dead ahead. <gasps> I'd better get off here then. Where? Wherever this is. Well, this is Waterloo, love. You wouldn't want to get off here. Why not? But you see those fires burning up ahead in the middle of the roundabout? Yeah. Well, that's Cardboard City where all the dossers live. So? Oh, they're cannibals, they are. Live off, people. They'd eat you up as soon as look at you. I can take care of myself. I've been thinking while you were asleep. A young girl like you shouldn't be alone in a place like London. A young girl like you needs someone to take care of her. Will you stop, please? A young girl like you needs protecting from the pimps and the pushers and prostitutes. I want to get out here. If you stay with me, I, I can... I pull over. I can look after you. I said pull over. I want to get out. Don't let go of the wheel. Or you'll have us right through the barrier. Don't touch me! Will you look at that, my butt and the lorry? He's had more to drink than I have. Yeah, I, I think he wants to share it with us. He's coming this way. Here, if he crashes on our island, do you think we'll get salvage rights? <laughs> Where's Disaster at Waterloo, take one. It is now nearly two hours since a traffic accident involving a tanker vehicle sent a vast chemical fireball searing through the subway home of many of London's destitute. I now have with me Mr Orange, a spokesman for Slaughter Tech UK, who were renting the tanker at the time of the accident, and one of their top research scientists, Professor Pseudonym. Professor Pseudonym. I understand that Slaughter Tech are a well-known supplier of chemical weapons. Uh, I never knew. No one told me. I, I only wanted to help mankind. Uh, uh, what the professor is trying to say in his own eccentric, egg-headed manner is that uh, whilst a small percentage of Slaughter Tech's work is concerned with defence technology, uh, the majority of our time is spent seeking to aid humanity uh, through the development of better and more powerful detergents. Detergents? I was only following orders. Yes, indeed. In fact, all the unfortunate tanker contained was a trial consignment of Mr. Happy, the new Wonder Scourer, on its way to secret trials in the greasier parts of northern England. So this spillage doesn't pose any kind of a threat to human life? Only if it's very, very greasy human life. If I had known then what I know now... I would have become a watchmaker. Uh, what a marvellous eccentric sense of humour. Well, also here with me, I have a man who was sleeping rough close to the scene of the accident and claims he can give us an eyewitness account, Bill Shabby. Well, I was sitting over there across the road from the ball ring drinking me Thunderbird and wishing I bought paint stripper instead when I hear an explosion, just like Hiroshima, but without the Japanese. And when the smoke clears, there's nothing. No tanker, no homeless. Just a blooming great blob of jelly about 30 feet high. Cut it, Phil. He's pissed. And board, please. I did see jelly, you know. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I can see it again now. Look! Get the camera running, Phil. Get it running. Look at the size of that thing. Accident at Waterloo, take two. Kate Pushy reporting from the bullring where, incredible as it may seem, a great mound of luminous jelly seems to be rising up like, well, like a great rising mound of luminous jelly. Jelly that is now moving across the road towards the police lines. Hey, perhaps it's going to give it some thought. Perhaps not. Oh, 
All the police and their vehicles have been eaten, digested, absorbed by this hideous thing, which seems to be growing in size as I speak. Mr. Orange, your company's <laughs> chemicals seem to have created this creature. What are we witnessing here? Uh, uh, the remarkable scaring pair of Mr. Happy. <laughs> It's coming this way, Kate! A professor pseudonym, can you offer an explanation? There are some forces man was never meant to meddle with. I am going to devote the rest of my life to gardening. <laughs> oh, oh, look at it in the National Theatre. Oh, and it spat it out again. Hey, we'd better get further back, Kate. Ladies and gentlemen, we all now face a grave threat. A threat to our very existence. Throw open your windows and warn your neighbours. Warn the world. The blob is coming your way. So much for the SPG Suicide Squad, General. Amateurs, Minister. If you want a futile gesture of self-sacrifice, you should come to the army. That's what we're here for. Point taken, General. Assemble a few platoons of men and march them, whistling cockney ditties, into the heart of that thing, will you? It's time this whole preposterous affair threw up a few heroes. You heard him, Sergeant Major. Assemble the Queen's own royal sitting ducks. Yes, sir. And shall I ring up the sun and get them to send a bevy of big-breasted beauties to wave the boys off as well? Is that traditional, Sergeant? It seems to be so these days, sir. <laughs> Jack! <laughs> Who fired that cruise missile? The analogy that you asked for, sir. Ah, thank you, Sergeant Sachi. Yeah, mm, it's just as I fear. There seems no doubt whatsoever. That thing is marching on Parliament. Then there's only one resort open to us. We'll have to nuke it. Nuke it? In central London, sir. There's no point in doing it on Salisbury Plain, General. The creature's not there. But, but, but... Whatever the risk, we must do what we have to do. Posterity will show we had no other choice. And besides, I'm all excited now. Arm the warheads. Let's kick Green off. <coughs> Perhaps there is another way. <coughs> Who the hell is he? A professor pseudonym, Minister. One of the slaughter tech boffins who accidentally created the creature. I thought you'd gone off to be a gardener. I had, but whilst I was pottering in my potting shed, I invented this, a machine which makes it possible for us to communicate with vegetables. <laughs> I thought we already had telephone chat lines. Huh. An invention like that couldn't possibly work. But it does. I, I have spoken with our little green friends on several occasions and now. And what did they have to say for themselves? I'm not sure. I don't speak celery. Yeah, but, but they are teaching me. Oh, General, get this lunatic out of here. We've got some serious nuking to do. Escort this man to the epicenter of the explosion, son. Sure. No, wait. There's more I have to tell you. The machine doesn't just work on vegetables. It works on giant jelloid masses, too. Halt! You mean to say you've used this thing to communicate with the blog? Whilst it was sucking up the Savoy, I crept up close behind it and I recorded its cries. Listen. It sounds exactly the same. Yes, but now listen to it again. Hear it through the translator. Can you spare some change? 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 Could you spare a few coins, please? Oh, go on, mate. Got the price. Could you spare a few coins, please? Spare me a few pence, please. I believe that this essentially brainless creature has become as one with the homeless people it originally absorbed. Their intelligence has become its intelligence. Their hungers, its hungers. Thank God he didn't swallow Oliver Reed instead. What those poor people once wanted, this creature now wants. And it won't rest until it gets them. So how do you propose we stop it, Professor? Well, you could start by giving it what it's asking for. How much spare change have we pumped into that thing so far, Professor? 45,000 tons of 10 peas and a smattering of 50s. Parliament has been saved. 
But how long could we go on like this? We can't keep the army in constant action on the streets of a British city. Uh, you're forgetting Belfast, Minister? Good. I try my best. If you were homeless, Minister, what would you desire most after food and drink? Well, I can't say I've ever really considered the possibility of a tunnel of shelter, I think. Exactly! Yeah. <laughs> and that is what I suggest we find for the creature. Ah, but that thing is enormous now. We'd never find a space big enough to accommodate it, let alone be able to work out its council tax bill. It's that or have a 200-foot dosser continually walking the streets. But the cost! Couldn't we still just bomb it? Uh, certain sections of the public are beginning to show a degree of sympathy for the creature on ours, huh? Uh, Greenpeace are thinking of sending a boat. Do things my way, and perhaps we can use my translating device to befriend it and do something to help the poor, homeless souls that perhaps still live within? Hmm, I have an idea. Somewhere to house the creature? Mm, amongst other things, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Professor, go and talk to your glutinous chum and tell it we will find it somewhere to live. Marvellous. <laughs> you won't regret this decision, I promise you. Come along, come along, come along, come to your little profi. That's right, Professor. If you could just steer it in through the gates, tell it we've got just what it's looking for inside. All mod cons and a few of the gems most yuppies would kill for. Oh, look at the way that thing follows him like a lamb to the. <laughs> pass you. <laughs> uh, pass me the megaphone a moment. Excellent work, Professor. Uh, you're developing quite a rapport with the creature. It might be 12 tons of dangerous dessert, but it still has the same basic needs as us. Shelter, warmth, love. You make it sound almost human. It is! <laughs> of course, Professor. And uh, now, if you'll be so kind as to guide it through the doors and into its new home. And in it goes. <laughs> Close the doors, General. Close the doors, men! Well done, Professor. Just where we wanted. Oh, this isn't a warehouse. This is a cold store. A part of the new Covent Garden market, actually. One of the most efficient freezing units in Europe. Uh, the thing's imprisoned inside, Minister. Ah. Shall we start the freezing process before it slimes its way out again? Uh, yes, indeed, General. And restrain the Professor, will you? Confiscate his device in case he tries to warn the monster. But you promised it a home. And that's what it's getting. A final resting place. But you promised it would live! I promise simple solutions and difficult problems. That's how you get elected in this country. Crank up the cold, Sergeant! Ready to up, sir! The jelly is beginning to set, Minister. You're killing it! Of course. It's barely moving. And a little more! It's frosting over. Just a few degrees more. It's dead. And we didn't even need to take it down to Arctic temperature. Just the cold of a normal London winter and our problems quietly solved. The homeless who ate London have died of hypothermia. Meanwhile, in the newly rebuilt restaurant of the Savoy Hotel. Waiter, I don't recall ordering jelly for dessert. You have been listening to the cabaret of Dr. Caligari by Alan Gilby. <laughs> wait! Wait! We can't close the program yet. Someone must be punished. But why, Dr. Caligari? Yes, why? <laughs> because it's the format, that's why. 
Every week we are supposed to lure some sickening sinner to disclose their sordid secrets, and then we sentence them to some appropriate punishment. <laughs> it is just, it is preordained, and it is also <laughs> fun. Mm, that's true. Quit my mind that. <laughs> So, who are we going to get, old oh, Sultan of Serious Consistency? That story had a bigger cast than a huge, obese, fat person with a broken leg. <laughs> How about that driver of the tanker truck who got a bit pervy with a girl? Eh? Very well. Summon forth the tanker driver. It's not blooming fair. I only drove the truck. I didn't make the muck in the back. You've got a point, you know. Then I shall also summon up the scientist to answer for his crime. I saw the error of my ways. Why not punish those that made the creature angry in the first place? Those who didn't help the homeless. Bring forth all those who did not donate ten pence. How can any individual be held responsible for the failings of the state? Bring forth the government. Bring forth the government. Bring forth the government. <laughs> All right. I'll have everyone who voted for you in as well. It's getting very crowded in here, Dr. Kelly Garmy. And yet, there is still one guilty party missing. One who sits back and witnesses the misery of others, and yet never lifts a finger to help. You mean? Yes. The listener. Anthrax. Snuff. Fetch. You have been listening to the cabaret of Dr... Oh, we've done that bit. In it, you heard my assistants, Snuff, Sylvester McCoy and Anthrax, Victoria Wicks. In our story tonight, in order of appearance were Jane Whittenshaw as the computer, Charles Millam as the foreign general, Alex Barker as Agent Orange, Gerald Denny as the homeless Geordie, David McKinney as the homeless boy, Richard Tate as Professor Pseudonym, Ronald Herdman as the driver, Sharon Henry as the hitchhiker, Cassie McFarlane as Kate Pushy. All the other parts, and there were lots of them, weren't there, were played by the cast. The director <laughs> is Anne Edivine, and I, John Woodvine, am your host. That will be anthrax and snuff. Well, go and open the door.